Thanks. Absolutely. Go ahead. Which one of you would begin first? I will begin, if possible. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Rourke, yeah? Perfect. Uh, show now. No, Ms. Morrow. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Madame la Présidente, Mesdames et Messieurs les membres du Committee. Madame Chair, uh, members of the Standing Committee on Canadian Patrimony, thank you for the invitation to appear before you today. While this study covers a wide range of topics, we are here to highlight one very specific dimension, the need to combat the growing threat of deepfake pornography, deepfake, and its effects on women and girls in Canada. Of deep fakes. One, what is it? Two, who is affected? And lastly, what can be done about it? So, deep fake technology, as you know, is generative AI that creates fake audiovisual content by manipulating a person's appearance and likeness. But as the technology advances, AI generated content has become increasingly sophisticated and harder to distinguish from real life footage. Lifelike deep fakes can now be generated using just a single photo of a person. And as a result, it's not just celebrities and public figures who are vulnerable. Everyone is vulnerable to this technology. And though there are other applications to deepfakes, by far the most common use is non-consensual porn. The vast majority of deepfakes are pornographic, and these overwhelmingly feature female subjects. It's important for the committee to know that this gendered and sexualized use of the technology is not new. The term deepfake actually originated in 2017, stemming from the practice of using online tools to switch female celebrities' faces onto pornographic videos. So in other words, non-consensual porn has kind of been central to the technology since its very beginning. And while the unauthorized use and creation of fake intimate images is not a new phenomenon, Photoshop, for example, has been around for decades, the advent of generative AI technology has taken this issue to a whole new level. 30 seconds. Today, highly realistic and convincing fake pornographic content can be produced quickly and with minimal efforts and skills. Even when fake, these types of images inflict real emotional, societal, and reputational harm on victims. And now even children are affected. In the past year, reports have exploded of schoolgirls who have found themselves the subject of pornographic deepfakes made and shared by their own classmates. All this to show that deepfake porn is not a trivial matter. It's real. It has a significant threat on people and on human dignity. And as such, it demands our attention and action. Thank you, Ms. Rock. You have uh, two minutes and 16 seconds. Thank you. To effectively address this issue, it's crucial to understand how existing laws can be extended to cover deepfakes, but also why current regulatory frameworks are insufficient. Firstly, Canadian legislation prescribing the non-consensual distribution of pornography, such as Section 162.1 of the Criminal Code, should be reviewed and extended to include altered images such as deepfakes. This sends a clear message that it is wrong and must be denounced. However, it is important to recognize that this is not enough. Unlike a real recording, deepfakes are not tied to a specific time, location, or sexual partner. They can easily be produced and distributed anonymously. And so in practice, it will often be difficult to identify perpetrators and hold them legally accountable, which will limit the deterrent effects of such provisions. Additionally, even when an individual perpetrator is identified, criminal or civil penalties cannot restore a victim's privacy, dignity, or sense of safety particularly when the content continues to circulate in, a, in the public domain. To address these ongoing harms, we must consider the role and responsibility of digital platforms. Tech platforms such as Google and pornography websites have already created procedures that allow individuals to request non-consensual porn of themselves be removed and delisted from their websites. This is not a perfect solution. Once the content is distributed publicly, it can never be fully removed from the internet but it is possible to make it less visible and therefore less harmful. Implementing such systems would mitigate the reputational harm caused by non-consensual porn, whether it be real or synthetic, and provide a more immediate and practical recourse for victims. Public regulatory bodies should work with major online platforms to require such procedures and ensure they are effective, accessible, and meaningfully enforced. 30 seconds. Lastly, this technology must be understood within the context of gender-based violence and societal attitudes towards sex women's sexuality. The non-consensual sharing of porn 
already is weaponized against women and is further exacerbated by deepfakes because anyone is able to create and distribute such content. Women will have limited options to protect themselves and is already being used to target, harass, and silence female journalists and politicians. If unchecked, deepfakes threaten to rewrite the terms of participation in the public sphere for women. This technology is rapidly evolving and harms have already materialized. While no one law can eliminate it, we can take action and legislators have a role to lead these efforts. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rourke. I now go to Mr. Semok Uto, please, for five minutes. Madam Chair, committee members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak before you this afternoon. Uh, by way of brief background, uh, my name is Keita Semak Uto. Uh, I'm from Vancouver. Uh, I was just called to the bar last month, and I've been practicing uh, primarily in family law with also a mix of uh, privacy and workplace law as well. Uh, I attended law school at Dalhousie in, Nova in Halifax, and uh, while there I took a privacy law course. I chose to uh, write my term paper on the concept of deep deepfake videos, which we've been discussing today. Uh, I was interested in the way that a person could create a deepfake video, uh, specifically a sexual or pornographic one, how that could violate a person's privacy rights. Uh, and in writing that paper, I discovered the, the clear gendered uh, dynamic to uh, the creation and dissemination of these kind of deepfake videos. As a case in point, uh, around January of this year, uh, somebody online made and publicly distributed uh, sexually explicit AI deepfake images of Taylor Swift. Uh, they were quickly shared on Twitter, uh, rep uh, repeatedly viewed. I think one photo seen as many as 50 million times. Um, and in an Associated Press article, a uh, professor at George Washington University in uh, the United States, she referenced women as canaries in the coal mine when it comes to the abuse of artificial intelligence. Uh, she quoted, uh, it's not just going to be the 14-year-old girl or Taylor Swift. It's going to be politicians. It's going to be world leaders. It's going to be elections. Um, so even back before this in April 2022, uh, it was striking to see the capacity for es essentially anybody to, cr to take photos of somebody's social media, turn them into deep fakes, and uh, distribute them widely without really any regulation. And again, the targets of these deep fakes, while they can be celebrities, they can be world leaders, oftentimes it's people without the kind of finances or, or protections of uh, a well-known celebrity. Um, and so worst of all, I think, and in, in writing this paper, I discovered uh, there is really no adequate system of law yet that protects victims from this kind of privacy invasion. Um, I think that's something that really is only now being addressed with uh, somewhat with the, the online harms bill. Um, I did look at the uh, criminal code. There's section 162, which uh, prohibits the publication, distribu uh, distribu distribution, sale of an intimate image. Uh, but the defini definition of intimate image in, in that section uh, is a video or photo in which a person is nude. The person had a reasonable expectation of privacy when the, uh, it was made or when the offense is committed. And again, I think the reasonable expectation of privacy element will uh, come up a lot in uh, legal conversations about deep fakes. Uh, when you take somebody's social media photo that's taken and posted publicly, it's questionable whether they had a, a reasonable expectation of privacy when it, was, when it was taken. So in the paper, I looked at a variety of torts, which I thought, you know, if the criminal law can't protect victims, perhaps there is a private course of action in which uh, victims can sue and perhaps get damages or, or whatnot. I looked at uh, public disclosure, private facts, intrusion upon seclusion, other torts as well, uh, and I just didn't find any of them really satisfied the circumstances of a deep fake, uh, pornographic deep fake scenario. Again, with the focus of reasonable expectation of privacy not really fitting the bill. Um, as I understand today, there have been uh, recent uh, proposals for legislation and, and legislation that, that's come into force. Uh, in British Columbia, there's the Intimate Images Protection Act. Uh, that was from March 2023, um, and the definition of intimate image in that act, uh, it means a visual recording or visual simultaneous represent, representation of an individual, whether or not they're identif uh, identifiable, and whether or not the image has been altered in any way in which they're engaging in a sexual act. And I think the broadening of the definition of intimate image, not just the, uh, you know, uh, an image of someone who is, um, uh, engaged in the sexual act when the photo is taken, but altered to uh, make that representation uh, that seems to be covered in um, the Intimate Images Protection Act. 
uh, the, the drawback of that act is that it's, while it does provide a, a private right of action, uh, the damages are limited to $5,000, which uh, seems negligible in, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, I, I suppose we'll talk more about Bill C-63 in this, in this discussion. Um, and I, I do think that uh, it goes in the right direction in, in some regard. Uh, it does put a duty on, on operators to uh, police and regulate what kind of materials online. Um, and another benefit is that it expands uh, the definitions again of um, the kinds of material that should be uh, taken down. Um, so that act requires the operator to, or once passed, it'll require the operator to take down material that sexually victimizes a child or re-victimizes a survivor. And that Thank definition. Thank you, Mr. Semakuto. Can oh. you wind up, please? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I, I'll I'll conclude there. <laughs>